We have a whole day of adventure planned. Oh man. <laughs> Y'all have a great day. So Welcome much. to the island. Every year we get in around 100 to 200 patients. It became the eighth engineering wonder of the world when it was finished. Got some sharks to check out next here. Knees bent, arms out, weight back, boom, you're right. Definitely one of the coolest things I think I've ever done. In last week's episode, we started our epic Florida Keys road trip down the A1A, showing you where to feed giant tarpon, sip on delicious local beer, and get out on the beautiful teal water in the Upper Keys. And today, we continue south to the Middle Keys, taking you to Marathon, Pigeon, and Grassy Key for some underwater adventure, history, and fun in the sun, Florida Keys style. We're Howard and Caitlin Newstate, world travelers and full-time RVers who've been exploring North America and beyond. Our passion is sharing the wonderful and sometimes challenging parts of our life on the road with you, taking you off the beaten path, meeting interesting people, and trying new things. Each week, we bring you along with us to explore unique things about every new state we visit. This is beautiful. <laughs> I'm so excited. All right, you're gonna go check in? Welcome to Sunshine Key RV Resort. This will be our home base for the next few days as we explore Marathon, Grassy Key, and the rest of the Middle Keys. So let's check out our new home. Several of the campsites overlook the water, which is pretty awesome. And there's this great walking path that goes all the way from one end to the other all along the water side. And if you're not in an RV, don't worry, you can still stay here in one of these really cool, beautifully colored tiny homes right on the water. Water is so clear. It's so warm. Oh my god. Really? Yeah. Water is like, not bath water, but it's plenty warm. <laughs> I like these people down here floating, having a drink. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. One thing I've definitely noticed is the connection between this RV resort and the water. There are lots of amenities like the little beaches. There's even a marina that if you're staying here, you can bring your boat and dock it here. And they have a fish cleaning station. The pool. Ooh, this is nice. Howard, mm. now the very important question. Yes. What's for dinner? Oh, Caitlin, how about some wine first? We opted for cocktails instead of wine for sunset, but I think it's gonna be worth it. It is hot, and wine just really isn't that good when it's that hot. No. <laughs> The whole day of adventure planned. I am so excited, slightly nervous, because I'm about to try something that I've never done before, and it involves this massive cable system. Kaylin, come here. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> All right, that's gonna be I fun. I'm ready. Welcome to the Lagoon on Grassy Key, home of Keys Cable Park, a truly unique experience where experts and beginners alike can get out on the water to wakeboard or kiteboard without a boat. As someone who's never even gone water skiing, I didn't really know what to expect, but I was up for the challenge. Sorry, bummer. You're gonna have to go low pony at this point. Okay. We met up with TK, operations manager at the Lagoon, who got me all geared up. I think that's perfect. And ready to take on the cables. Tuck it up under your arm. Boom, grab the bottom. You're ready to go. Walk on out. Feels so official. Okay. As long as you go knees bent, arms out, weight back, boom, you're riding. As a first timer, I was given an excellent briefing on what I was about to try and tips and techniques for being successful. After all, my goal was to just stay up on the board. We'll just try to ride straight. <laughs> like, it's a lot of info. Okay. Yeah, I got it's it. a lot, but it's a lot easier. I feel like to yeah, like once you about. get the hang of it, then. Oh it's... yeah, when you get the hang of it, it's like. There's not a lot of movement involved, and Josh has full control of everything, so he's gonna be working with you. And then I have a microphone, <laughs> so I'll be streaming at you. thing about a cable park versus trying this out on the open water with a boat is that there's someone in the tower controlling your speed and if you fall down you can immediately get back up and try again. Man, I definitely see the appeal. Your adrenaline gets going once you're up and you're like, I'm doing it, I'm doing it. And then you're smacked right back to reality when you're like, and I'm down. 
In conclusion, I love this. As somebody who has never done it before, this is a wonderful way to be able to learn. And the guys explained everything in very simple terms. And I got up, I think I only crashed one time before actually getting up and going. And that is a big accomplishment, I think, for me. They say I did a good job, but they have to say that, right? <laughs> but I feel like I really got the hang of it. And being able to have that cable right there, and if you do wipe out at all, you can just pick right back up and go is awesome. I already feel it in my arms. It is a major workout. I never really quite got the hang of the turn down. That'll be next time. The story behind the lagoon is pretty cool too. An old limestone quarry turned fish farm, which then sat abandoned for a while. The current owner saw its potential. We put the towers in and we cleaned up all their old farming equipment, which was like a breaking bad looking situation. And now they're in the process of revamping the area even further. But this is another oasis spot. We'll have like a couple docks down so you can hang out, have a picnic table. You could call over to Bongo's and they would bring you food and drinks. Oh, cool. And you could swim with the family and hang out. Colorful murals and art installations round out the laid back vibe at the lagoon. And to top it all off, Bongo's Cafe will soon be opening, where you can grab a cold drink after your session and a delicious meal. And right down the street, you can book a stay at Grassy Flats. Enjoying yourselves? Heck yeah. All right, there we go. Their eco-friendly hotel, which is also undergoing an expansion. More Cypress tables. This is like an old rum runner style boat made out of mahogany and sapodilla and different woods and stuff like that. And here as you walk out on grassy flats, it is a flat. So the water will actually come all the way up to here, but it'll actually drain out once a day and then comes right back up in. This one will be a, a 21 and up sort of side of things. There'll be another pool here and another tiki bar. So you can have your families here. You can have people who are trying to relax without that. Um, and then we'll actually have a couple of vacation rentals where people can come and use these facilities as well. Our second stop of the day is a ferry ride over to Pigeon Key. Hi, I love your shirt. Ooh, good morning. <laughs> it's one of the most historic locations in all the Florida Keys. Y'all have a great day, so welcome much. to the island. And with that, we were stepping back in time to learn about this tiny island under the world famous Seven Mile Bridge. We're all able to make the drive down the A1A today because of what many called a crazy idea back in the early 1900s. A man by the name of Henry Flagler, who happened to leave his mark all over the Sunshine State from St. Augustine to Miami, wanted to make travel to the elusive Keys possible. In part because he wanted to open a shipping port in Southwest Florida and eventually set his sights on Key West, but he couldn't find any investors. He announced his plan to take his railroad all the way to Key West and everyone called him crazy. They said he was nuts. They thought he'd gone right over the deep end. They called it Flagler's Follies. They thought he'd lost his mind. One of the reasons they refused to invest is they said Henry was too old. He was already in his 70s, and that was considered very old for that time in our history. And people said, Henry, what are you thinking? Why would you start a project of that magnitude in your advanced years? You've lost your mind. Second reason they refused was because they didn't believe he could build it. Henry knew he was going to have to construct 42 bridges from the mainland to Key West, and building a bridge that was seven miles long was unheard of. No one had ever attempted anything like it before. They said, you're never going to finish it. You can't do it. And the third reason they refused was cost. Henry's estimates were $50 million. All the investors said, we want nothing to do with it. So in 1905, he established the Florida East Coast Extension as the sole investor and he began construction on the railroad by building 82 work camps all along the route so that work could be going on in multiple places at one time. Pigeon Key became the most historic of the work camps because of the job of the workers at this camp was to build that bridge that we just walked under. It became the eighth engineering wonder of the world when it was finished. 400 men lived on the tiny five-acre island, and it became a marathon, hence the town's name, to finish the project in time for Henry to see his dream come alive. On January 22nd of 1912, Henry boarded the train very early in the morning up near West Palm, where he lived at that time, and by 1043, he'd arrived in Key West with about 10,000 people on the platform waiting to greet Henry. He was 82 years old, and it would be the first and only time he would ride his entire overseas rail line because he passed away 
16 months later at the age of 83. The railroad was partially destroyed years later by a hurricane in 1935 and was eventually converted to the overseas highway. The skinny, often terrifying two-lane road was the only way to get to the Keys up until 1982. But today we have a much wider and safer option running parallel to the old railway that started it all. That was an amazing tour. Incredibly informative. Our tour guide was excellent. We learned so much about Henry Flagler and what an impact he had not only on the Keys, but the entire state of Florida. And the big moral and takeaway for me was don't let anybody ever tell you that you're too old or too crazy to try something. If you have an idea, go for it. Flagler didn't start this project until he was in his 70s. Yeah, just think about that. Like People would not have had access to this beautiful area if he didn't go for it. Located at the end of a street next to the dock is a place called Keys Fisheries, and they have great local seafood. And not just any seafood, home of the famous Lobster Reuben, where they've sold exactly 346,222 sandwiches. Well, make it 346,223 after we ordered one. And boy, does it live up to the hype. Lobster. Wow. Our next stop is quite well known throughout the Keys, the state of Florida, and beyond for the amazing work they're doing to save and rehabilitate turtles so they can be released back into the wild. The requirements for release would be three good working flippers, at least one good working eye, and you cannot be floating. Since we opened in the 80s, we have released over 2,000 turtles. I'd say every year we get in around 100 to 200 patients. Opened in 1986, the former hotel turned turtle hospital has ample space and equipment to care for sick and injured patients. With the ability to perform surgeries and procedures on different species of turtles, around 75% of the turtles that come here for help are able to be released back into the ocean. Some are permanent residents and now serve as educational ambassadors to help visitors learn about the importance of looking out for sea life while boating, fishing, or setting crab and lobster traps. It's not only the sea turtles that come in for boat strikes in the Keys, there's manatees quite a lot. That was an awesome tour. Yeah, it's amazing how close you can get. Now, you can't touch them and you can't actually directly feed them, although Caitlin did successfully throw a whole lot of food into the main tank area. There's so many tanks. It's actually really amazing. So that way the ones that need specialized care can get it. And the ones who are just kind of chilling, they can chill out in a really big tank. And that last tank is really cool because it is tidal. So it rises and falls with the tides and it has a natural bottom. So it creates a natural environment for them. Now we take you to Marathon's newest attraction, Aquarium Encounters, one of the coolest aquatic experiences you can have in the Keys, getting up close and personal with sharks, rays, and fish of all kinds. We've got over 30 different species of fish that are in here, and this is where we're gonna find most of our interactive tanks. This exhibit, though, is Stingray Cove. I would say our most popular of the touch tanks. You are more than welcome to get your hands right on in if you'd like. The stingrays are super friendly and they come right on up to you. Can you see that? Oh my God, right there. Wow. Stingray Cove is also one of our interactive tanks that guests can get into. Uh, kind of like one of the encounters you're going to be doing here later. Got some sharks to check out next here. We've actually trained our nurse sharks to respond to a target. Each one has a symbol corresponding with a sound. So we can call them up and that's how we do feeding sessions with our sharks. Blind fish, yeah. Look at that group. Best way to beat one is to eat one. Yep. And that's our slogan around here. Unfortunately, these beauties are highly invasive. And they've only been in our local waters for about 30 years. So predators don't quite recognize them as a food source. They do have 18 venomous spines, most of which can be seen on that top, that dorsal ridge. Also have an uncontrollable appetite. They can expand their stomach 30 times its normal size out competing everything. They also have a knack for eating juvenile fish. So collectively, this whole exhibit is 200,000 gallons. Now it is separated in the middle with the feeding windows. So when you're in the water on our coral reef side, what you're gonna be able to do is you're gonna slide the food right through. It's gonna kind of hang out by the window and the sharks or maybe an eel will come right up and grab it from you. Wow. I'm so excited. Now is the time for one of the encounters, and I'm actually gonna put on a wetsuit, snorkel gear, and go get in this tank and feed some of the fish, and I think I'm even gonna feed a shark. All right, I gotta go shower off. 
Caitlin, when was the last time you wore a wetsuit? I don't think I've ever worn a wetsuit, actually. It's a little tricky to put on. After a quick safety briefing for my protection and the protection of the sea life, it was time to mask up and start feeding the fish. The entire time you're in the tank, you have a staff member with you, guiding you, taking photos and video, and giving you tips and tricks for the feeding. How was it? That's awesome. Swimming with the fish never gets old. And it's so cool, there's just so many different varieties in there, and different colors and shapes. Feeding the stingrays, they're like little vacuums. They have strong suction on them. After feeding the stingrays and fish, it was time to head over to the sharks. And just as described, there are a series of holes in the divider. You put the fish through the hole and voila, shark. to another paradise, Key West. I know, it's the last stop on our epic road trip, but we're going out with a bang because it is gonna be awesome. Next week, venture to the capital of the Conch Republic with us for some Key West fun, a secret key lime pie recipe, ghost stories, dolphin watching, and so much more. Make sure you subscribe and click the bell for notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly adventures. Thanks so much for watching. See you next week.